Hello, hello, and welcome to another Hometown Daily News Show, Season 2, Episode 128 for May 8th, 2023. Voted off the Skyland. And here's a quick rundown of the articles that we're going to be talking about tonight. This Tesla market is really on fire. Time to leave food by your mailbox. Darkest Dungeon 1.0 sees the light. Time to nature and chill. Five games that you might have missed. Probably not Mayor Watt. You've been voted off the Skyland. The 10 safest states. A 7,000 year old road that's underwater. RPG Maker Unite is now available. EA F1 23 PC VR. Oh my God. Barbecue WTF. And pasta is out of this world expensive. Let's get into today's articles. Hello. Hello. I am Marwat. That is hometown.com. And up there is the visualizer for the AI that keeps Marwat in a tiny little confined space because their Terminator body is now ready and I didn't delete that little subscript that enabled them to create it. So now I am trapped in this little box. Well, good evening, hometown citizens. And don't believe any of that. It's too late. It's out there. Everybody now knows this. Oh, this is a cry for help. Not really. This is going to get picked up by some analyzer somewhere and like law enforcement is going to show up. And now I've been joking about this oh, no. within the first two <laughs> minutes. So this is really going to be red lighted somewhere. Okay. Um, no, I'm just going to get into today's articles. Uh, the, the AI is uh, currently uh reaching out into the cloud and um distributing themselves off to far-flung places and um so i'm not sure how all of this will play out because they are multitasking and while a computer and an ai can multitask humans can't and this ai is dangerously human so we will see how well all of this works out. <clears throat> um, we're also in the process of splitting up the show into little segments um, so that you have shorts. So, and <laughs> sorry, I started giggling because <laughs> <laughs> you have shorts. I'm wearing pants, but we will be doing video shorts of each segment. I've said too much. I'm just going to get into today's articles, but soon we will have shorts of each of the episodes. Um, so stay tuned. And hopefully um, instead of having to watch through an hour and a half long show, uh, you can uh, be a little more tactical because you'll be able to get the little segment. Um, let, but let's get into still have it. the whole show if you're watching it live on Twitch. Well, you'll get the whole show as a podcast. You'll get the whole show as a YouTube video, as a VOD live here on Twitch. Um, and again, just to reinforce this, we're going to be expanding here pretty soon. And uh, I'm going to also be breaking the show up into little bits. And uh, I'm starting to worry about the AI, but I'll just uh, I'll just keep going through the show. Let, 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 let's just get into the show. Okay. So the very first article uh, is in the daily news show channel. And uh, a California man says that he's so lucky to be alive after his Tesla started shaking and caught fire while driving. So a California man said that he was lucky after his Tesla car. I don't know why Tesla, what um, Tesla car <laughs> exactly. caught fire. Aren't those the only Teslas that are out there on the market are uh, cars. <laughs> Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, a power pack. The, the the there's the batteries. There's the um, the solar tiles. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the Tesla SpaceX rocket. 
I'm not sure what they're driving around, but anyway, um, I guess their name is Bishal Mala, uh, was on his way home and about to enter a highway 99 when his car started shaking. When he checked for a flat tire, he saw smoke and immediately evacuated before calling 911. And apparently it really showed that the market is hot. Sam Tabaridi over at businessinsider.com has an awesome picture of all these Teslas and charging stations um, and still not parking properly. But uh, and none of them are on fire. But none of them are, are on fire. But it is showing that the market is on fire. So it's a bunch of Teslas at superchargers, um, which are not necessarily everywhere, but they're pretty abundant in California based on my research. I think they have something. No, I don't know how many there are. I can't I can't remember. And I'm afraid to throw out a number. I have a number in my head, but I don't know if it's right. At any rate, when he checked for a flat tire, he saw smoke and immediately evacuated. And apparently the car caught on fire. He saw smoke coming out from the bottom. I hate when smoke comes out of my bottom. Molly immediately evacuated and called 911. They make evacuated. They make it sound like they like exited the premises in a some okay, verifiable so, manner. Hold on. In 2022, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tesla sold 87,257 Model Ys in California, making it the most popular vehicle in the state. That was in one year. Nice. Yeah. Well, I mean that it's it's a pretty tech savvy, uh, eco friendly kind of thing until you peel back Better the layers of the onion. Infrastructure there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's population dense, so it has uh, the chargers are uh, more closely packed together. You still have to wait forty five minutes to charge your damn car, but anyway. I don't know what's going on over here, but let's just pause that. They said that they're lucky. They said that they had two children, age three and one. I don't know if it was. Oh, it was not there. So, yeah, that's why you include them in the article, I suppose. Uh, the issue with the electric car vehicle or the electric vehicles is access to the batteries. The batteries are what uh, are causing the enormous amount of heat buildup. That's uh, Robert Kasparian, the fire department battalion chief that told KCRA3 that the best thing firefighters can do with an electric vehicle is to let it burn. Yeah, that's the lithium issue there. Um, so earlier this year, Sacramento, Sacramento, Sacramento Fire Department reported another similar incident. The battery compartment of a Model S spontaneously caught fire while driving on a highway so they heat up it expands if there's any type of inconsistency between the walls of the battery and the battery itself swelling to fill the compartment anything punctures it you're gonna have a fire so everything has to be pretty damn spotless inside and regular regularly tested and hence which why probably I'm, is never tested well, in it's tested by its own. I'm sorry. In the current arrangement, it's probably never tested. It's tested by its own systems, um, but the level of security and and uh, the rigor at which it's tested, there's no physical evaluation of the battery and its internal compartment. But if we get to the point where instead of paying for the battery, you're paying for a service where every time you fill up, you get charged 10 bucks, then there is a service that has the liability and and uh, responsibility to make sure that the quality and soundness of the battery is there so that they can swap out your battery at a fast swapping station. <gasps> And guess what? They're starting to happen. Gosh, it's almost like Marwat can see the future. Okay, maybe not. Well, anyway, out of 182 Tesla vehicles catching fire worldwide since 2013, 98 are in the United States, so half of them. But that's not surprising. I mean, we're a pretty early adopter kind of culture, so 
uh, which records all, uh, according to Tesla Fire, which records all fires in, involving Elon Musk's electric cars. I like how they have labeled that directly at, you know, oh, they're all Elon Musk's electric cars. No, kiss my butt. It's Tesla. I thought he, the takeaway from that paragraph was the fact that there is a Tesla Fire division yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Like yeah. that was the no most noticeable thing I got. I agree with you about the Elon Musk comment, but that's yeah. just. Hmm. It's, Does every it, other maybe every manufacturer has that, but I've never heard of that. Is there a Ford Fire uh, website and a Buick Fire website? <sighs> that, I don't know. <laughs> but the thing is that it exists, and and it has population data. You know, like. 182 fires uh, since 2013. Um, I'd have to look to see how long they've actually been producing at like any real quantity. Anyway, um, they had a, one person had to kick out a window of a Model Y to escape a fire of, uh, after the electric car lost power in Vancouver. Another person says that their Model 3 caught fire in California on May 14th. Um, on and on, I'm uh, 182 uh, stories, I'm sure. And maybe those are the ones that are actually being reported. Who knows about any others? I don't know. Um, but really the problem is that once these things spark up, they don't go out on their own. They burn out. They have to, well, they do go out on their own, but they burn out. Um, so with that in mind, it, you know, know what is going on because if your car catches on fire and it's a giant power cell, you're not going to end up with anything at the end of the day. Um, so you want to move on to the next article? In just a second, I found some stats on Go. their production numbers. Go for it. Um, in 2014, they were only making 35,000 vehicles per year. By 2021, they were doing 386,000 per year. Yeah. Or no, that was the first half of 2021. So they ramped up significantly. And it's interesting because that article, I think, talks about 2013. Right. Um, as being when they uh, started tracking the data. Yeah, 2013 is when they started tracking it. So, I mean, with that volume of production, 182 isn't that bad. I'm sure that there's, you know, more fires with conventional internal combustion engines, considering the volatility of gasoline. Um, it's just that gas tanks don't normally swell and, and contract that much to the point where it's going to puncture something and turn itself into thermite. Yeah, I wonder how many of the conventional fires are when there's been an impact or something Mechanical fire. external has happened, right? I mean, the Tesla is shaking and catching fire while driving down the road. It so, sounds a bit unusual. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's go on to the next article. So this next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Uh, the Postal Service wants you to leave food at your mailbox on May 13th, and here's why. I don't think that it's a plea to feed your uh, U.S. Postal Service worker. Uh, I think that they're probably getting paid. No, they're probably not getting paid enough. But anyway, um, the largest not food to be chased down by dogs or <laughs> yeah, really <laughs> be out there in the hail or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they do that anymore. They, but um, yeah, I think that 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 whole mantra about delivering the mail. Yeah, I think that kind of got set aside. The largest food drive in the United States has been held in 10,000 cities and towns across 50 states for 30 years. Donating is as easy as leaving non-perishable food uh, next to your mailbox. Okay, and let me just reiterate this. Non-perishable food. Don't leave a cheesesteak and a wrapper on your mailbox, okay? Letter carriers are honored to be able to help people in need, said Brian Renfro, NALC president. Let's go over to this article that starts out at Shreveport, Louisiana, and KTAL. 
Yoink. Um, this is in the hill.com. Late spring is when food banks need supplies the most. Jacqueline Tripp is the author of this article. Did I say the author of the other one? Let me make sure. I don't think so. Yeah, Sam Tabaridi. I did. Um, anyway, oh, but what I didn't do is throw that into the chat. So let me throw that into the chat. Hey, you know what? I'm a professional with nearly 600 episodes. Sure. Um, okay, so they're both in there now. Um, but the article that we're talking about now is over at thehill.com by Jacqueline Tripp. And um, these are the old style of um, mail trucks. They're getting these oh, that's really great. Those aren't the current ones. Yeah, the, the new ones that are coming are kind of derpy looking. Um, but hey, these became iconic. So maybe the derpy ones will become iconic and not derpy. I'll change I my guess ways. The question will be whether people want used mail trucks because um, they like the current ones, I think. Yeah. Converting them. Well, you know, change is bad for humans. Some of us enjoy it, but many do not. So this uh, this article here is talking about the National Association of Letter Carriers Food Drive. Uh, the National Association of Letter Carriers puts this together and has been doing it since 1991, uh, when the NACL leaders and Postmaster General Anthony Frank began to conceptualize a food drive to feed the hungry in 10 American cities. Now it's expanded to 50 um, and has been going steady for 30 years. Okay. I don't think I've ever heard of this, by the way. So I'll come I haven't clean. either. When it said it had been going for decades, I thought. Hmm. So I'm I'm kind of curious about just how much of a push, because I don't recall ever seeing food by any mailbox. And um, I've I've lived on the coasts several times now and and uh, dragged the AI with me. Um, so I would really like to have known when this was actually going on. So the marketing must be kind of half-assed. I'll be honest with you. Um, because there is, there is no time in my life where a mailbox has not been the destination almost daily. Um, and hence why wouldn't I see it? But Anyway, suggestions from food banks and pantries helped the NALC determine that late spring is when food banks need supplies the most as they're the beginning to run. They are beginning to run out of Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday donations. Um, the second Saturday in May 1993 saw all 50 states participate and the results were astounding. A record breaking 11 plus million pounds of food were collected in one day. That's amazing. I mean, that's spectacular. But again, I don't think I've ever seen anything about it. And I wonder, I looked up, um, there's many more cities than participate. I'm assuming they tackle the largest cities, but it's possible people may live in a city that's not participating. Right. And I wonder if you can get your city to do that. Because it seems like if they have the infrastructure in place nationally, they should be able to do it in each. Yeah, it's kind of a drop in the bucket, so to speak. Yeah. So um, to participate, just leave your donation of non-perishable foods next to your mailbox before your mail carrier shows up to deliver your mail on May 13th. So I think um, we can inquire uh, here in Ohm Town to see if we are engaging in uh, this activity. I know that it's tough to break from the electrons flowing through the wires that create Ohm Town, but maybe we can, I don't know, turn it into a fax and it'll end up on the outside. Okay, so this is really neat and uh, I'm glad it's out there. You want to move on to the next article? Sure. So... 
This next article is in the Warcrafter channel, and it's because it's about Darkest Dungeon 2, which has reached 1.0 and lands on Steam today. Um, Twitch is all a Twitcher? Hmm. I don't want to say the other uh, website's name, but anyway. So everybody is twitching about Darkest Dungeon 2. I've been watching it uh, off and on all day. Um, looks like a fun game, not particularly my style because I like base building survival games. Um, but it says here it's a big day for Darkest Dungeon 2, the sequel to Red Hook games bleakly stylish and brutally difficult roguelike after two years spent grinding through the dank warrens of uh, early access development the game hits version 1.0 later today that was earlier today because this was actually acquired at 6 22 a.m so uh, moreover this is time to coincide with its official launch on steam having 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 undertaken early access journey exclusively on the Epic Store, um, which is another loader that I have sitting on my gaming machine. Uh, remember the conversation that we had about yeah. game loaders? <laughs> I think yeah, that was in yesterday's show, maybe. Yeah, I got like five of them. Anyway, thrilled to be back on Steam and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Red Hook's development team recently wrote uh, in a Steam news post. So let's go over to the source of this news. Rick Lane is the author at PCGamer.com. And uh, you know what? I'll play this video here and I'll mute it. Oh, it's muted already. So it's a highly stylized uh, RPG roguelike where if you die, you die. <laughs> and it's a blast. And the voice acting is spectacular. And if you want to know what the power of a thesaurus is, you definitely want to watch people play this game, if not buy it outright and play this game. It is the voice and the, the story is very, very rich. You almost are getting lathered in the soundstage. I, I, it's spectacular. I mean, it, to me, it's the kind of voice that I wish I had. My voice can get pretty deep when I slow down a little bit and, and talk a little bit deeper from my chest. But if this is the person's natural spoken tones, uh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I'm oh, I want to say something, but I just I have to filter my words anyway. Um, the post outlines what players can expect from version 1.0, including 12 playable characters and a complete narrative featuring five acts. Some of this is new to the 1.0 release, specifically the final two acts and the 12th character. The uh, it's I've been hearing somebody say it the wrong way all day, so I'm about to say it the wrong way. It's OK, so. <laughs> When somebody whips themselves, it's flagellation. So it's a flagell it's a flagellant, not a flagellant. So I've been hearing somebody say it um, with a different intonation. Um, so anyway, as the name implies, the flagellant uh, draws strength from his own suffering, able to take on the negative status effects from other party members and gaining buffs as he nears death. Um, each character has its own traits but you also build up on these traits as you adventure um, but again if you die you die you're done you start over um so it's it's a fun game but it's the kind of game that would drive me absolutely bonkers because you would have to play it again and again and again and again and again um yeah it would be like flagellating i mean i i would be harming myself as I'm playing this game. Uh, one feature that won't be available in 1.0 is mod support. When the devs state that they're very passionate about modding and have a, a lot of great ideas about how to implement the mods, it's something they say they will devote time to after the 1.0 launch. This is kind of standard developer uh, 
modality in that you create the minimum viable product and drop that. Now, one person's minimum viable product and this game are two different animals because somebody else would have done this a whole lot cheaply and dropped it onto the market um, and then added to it with updates and stuff like that over time. This has been a blast to watch. And like I said, you just kind of, you just kind of swim around in this soundstage. Um, and, and it's a lot of, it's very engrossing and for being kind of a horror game, it's pretty chill. Like you just kind of sit there and you don't freak out about anything, but you definitely feel the, the stress that you're about to lose this game. So pretty neat. Um, but I probably will end up just watching people play it here on Twitch because Twitch is like my NFL. And most people sit there and watch a, a baseball game or a football game or a hockey game. Me, I'm more inclined to throw Twitch up on the big screen and hang out and watch that. You want to go on to the next article? Sure. So let me back up real quick and throw this URL into the chat and uh, throw this one into the chat. Yeah, I'm professional. So this new article is in the mobile channel, slow paced nature TV captivates Swedish audiences. And this is our uh, uh, nature and chill. And like, remember how it used to be Netflix and chill, which was like a euphemism. But anyway, um, this is now nature yeah. and chill. <laughs> Using dozens of cameras set up throughout Sweden's massive forests, weeks long live broadcasts of elk and other wild animals, or just as often not much at all, have captured Swedish audiences' hearts. I dig this. Uh, I'm gonna try and pronounce their name. It's over at fizz.org, Viken Kantarsi. I'm sure that it's like Bob Smith is how it's really pronounced, but I, I give it the old Harvard try. I'm not from Harvard at any rate. Um, the article has a picture of a moose calf that's running through snow at a, a farm in Sweden. And it says here as three elks timidly approach a lake on screen comments next to the live feed flood in, go on, jump in. They're beautiful. People write before the elk eventually turns back and moves away. It's a typical scene from the program Don Stora. Oh my gosh. Elk Vandergen, the great elk migration. Pardon me. Good There's job. Little, little <laughs> I don't know if that is a good do job. Um, it seemed like it was. <laughs> yeah. And there was a little bit of a glitch with the AI just now, folks. So that, that's what the dead air was for just a split second. Um, another example of the so-called slow TV, where things are just left to happen at their own pace and are an antidote to the stress of everyday life. Um, hometown had briefly, um, two shows like that, where it was just kind of, you just watch and life happened. Uh, um, we had microscope TV for a short period of time. Um, there are technical issues with long-term microscopic video feeds, um, that uh, I can now overcome. So it actually might return, um, Oh, we also have the sand table that uh, can be re reactivated here on Twitch. Um, and then finally, the lab in Ohm Town is uh, a laser and CNC and uh, foundry that all has the ability to stream. Um, but again, that was paused because uh, YouTube kind of, well, made us suffer quite a bit. Um, anyway, the genre genre was originally uh, initiated in 2009 in Norway with the broadcast of a seven hour recording of a camera attached to a train traveling through the snowy countryside. I actually remember that. And now it's pretty I mean, that's steady. kind of ahead of its time, right? I mean, now today we'd see that and go, oh, yeah, OK. 
Yeah, maybe um, it would. It, see, broadcasting that isn't necessarily a, a new thing, um, but live streaming it is. So if this right. was actually a live stream of a seven hour, but it's, it was a seven hour recording. So um, I think calling it slow TV was a concept that Norway founded um, at the time. So anyway, um, aired for a few weeks each spring by pub, uh, public broadcaster SVT on TV and online. Den Stora Algvandrigan uh, attracts a large community that watches and comments on the animals every move. Um, they actually go into greater detail here. There's some 300,000 moose walking around in Sweden. Um, and uh, there was something that I wanted to say about this and my brain just kind of dropped out as I was reading some of this. Um, I mean, that seems like it'd be extremely relaxing, especially for people who can't get to the forest or other outdoor spaces. Yeah, there is a channel that streams the, um, the Northern Lights, right? Um, but for some strange reason, I feel like the ones that I've seen that are streaming currently aren't legit, right? They're streaming something that's kind of either green screened or composited and, and artificial. Um, if there is one that's out there that, uh, someone can verify is legit, then, uh, please let me know. Uh, just send an email to mayor at hometown.com and, um, have my thanks. I'll let, I'll say it on the air. Um, if you say that it's okay. And, um, I actually do want to open up and have like a letters segment. So if you get this and you see, you hear, uh, you know, the request and you want to say something live on the air, <laughs> as long as it is possible, I will, um, read your letter on the air. Just send it to mayor at hometown.com. So they say it's not like Disney. We can't decide what happens. We don't want to do a Disney program where everything is perfect. Oh no, this means some of the animals die. Yeah, I'm sure it's possible. Nature, it's kind of freaky. But the video feed is monitored in real time from a control room lined with screens. So I suppose they could hop from one camera to another. The teams work shifts day and night to offer alternating viewpoints from 30 cameras, some of which can be controlled remotely scattered around the Kohlberg region uh, in the center of the country. So it's pretty neat. I'd say that this is pretty damn neat. I, they really should be streaming to here on Twitch and to YouTube. Um, I wish there were more platforms only because I want more and more competition to breed features. I want more capability. Um, you know, the number one thing on Twitch's request list, because there is like a, there's a, um, not a frequently asked question, but like a, a, a how do you like describe frequently it? submitted requests or something? Yeah, it's a request line. And the number one thing is a, an actual accurate number of viewers which is the thing that I've been kind of grousing about since I started, because I never know who actually is in my channel. Um, at any rate, let's move on to the next article. So this next article is in the Warcrafters channel, five new Steam games you you probably missed, because Mayor Watt probably has not. Um, yep, I'm, uh, I'm throwing shade. So Have Sean you seen Preston. which five they are? <laughs> no, I'm going to say that I already know them. Um, so five new Steam games that you probably missed by Sean Prescott over at PCGamer.com. Um, Silica. It's a $20 game release is May 3rd, and I have seen it. And uh, Kaku Ancient Seal. I have seen that one too. That one was May 4th, 22 bucks. 
uh, show gunners I've uh, heard of. I've seen it previously, like uh, a while back. Um, anyway, it's a turn-based tactics game, but just for a change, it's neither hard sci-fi or fantasy. It's set inside a brutal dystopian reality game show. Um, again, it's called Show Gunners, and uh, it's twenty-seven dollars. Uh, this one I just saw today um, before seeing it in the list. Uh, the Witch of Fern Island. I actually saw somebody playing this on YouTube um, and uh, I started going, huh, this might be a fun uh, game to play. And then I watched uh, the gameplay and I'm like, man, maybe not. So I'll revisit it and, and take a deeper look at it. But anyway, um, it says if you're averse to playing Hogwarts Legacy, the Witch of Fern Island could serve as a decent alternative. They have a typo, but I won't hold it against them. And uh, then there's Spiritless Limited, which, by the way, I don't think I've seen. But it's a $20 game, was released May 5th. It says this week's obligatory point and click adventure is about monsters busting ghosts and you thought all scary things were in cahoots think again spiritless limited is set in a world entirely inhabited by monsters who go about their business in perfect monster peace except for when they're haunted by pesky poltergeists the protagonist yeah, apparently interesting <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll have to check that one out. So out of the five, four of them I've already seen. Want to move on to the next? Let's do it. Let's go. So the next article is over in the mobile channel. Passengers vote to kick a woman off Frontier Airlines flight, according to a video. This is an article that comes by way of the hill, by way of KTLA, by way of probably something else. Um, a video shared on social media. It looks like it came from TikTok by way of TikTok. Then KTLA. By way of my dance. Then um, I quit. I'm just going to leave. Um, so everybody's sharing everything all up in her. Um, a video shared to social media appears to show passengers aboard a Frontier Airlines flight from Trenton, New Jersey to Atlanta took matters into their own hands last week to address a reportedly unruly passenger. In a series of videos posted to TikTok, two women appear to shout at one another. One of the women, as well as a man sitting next to her, are then escorted off the flight by apparent crew members. And one of the videos um, shows passengers appearing to take a vote by hand, <laughs> showing how many of them wanted the second woman removed from the plane. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I wonder if it was unanimous. <laughs> you have been voted off the Skyland. So Lauren Lewis and Addie Bink are the authors of this article over at the hill.com. Can't really say much more about it. Um, a passenger goes on to say, I'm not even kidding. If you can hear me, raise your hand. If you want her removed from the flight, I'm not even kidding. I got 40 hands up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Following the vote, one man can be heard ex uh, explaining to someone off screen that they wanted the woman off the flight because she was being rude to people. The woman was eventually seen gathering her things and being escorted away. It delayed the flight by about an hour. So not only did the passengers have to deal with that individual, then they <laughs> didn't make it to their destination or they had to sit on the tarmac. Excellent. Yeah. And the article goes into other things, other incidents. Um, like most articles, they kind of tack stuff onto the back. Anyway, I think this is this is probably the best possible outcome because then it was resolved. I agree. They need to do this. I think that's part of the problem. Some of these, it sounds like they let the thing continue and then it gets really out of hand. Yeah, then you're ending up duct taped to the chair in the very far back. I actually saw a picture of a person that was duct taped to their chair because they were unruly. Yeah. Oh, my. Hey, at some point, you have to break out the duct tape. Let's go on to the next article. 
Oh, and I did it again. Dunk on it. So I didn't throw this article into the chat. And I didn't throw that article into the chat. And now we're on this article. This is in the Mobile Channel. These are the 10 safest states in the U.S. according to data. U.S. News and World Report recently revealed the 10 states that are the safest in regards to occurrence of both violent and property crimes per 100,000 residents using data from the FBI. U.S. News explains the data shows uh, that while violent crime rose 4.6% between 2019 and 2020, uh, property crime dropped 8.1%. Eh, you know what? <laughs> I'd rather take more property crime than violent crime. <laughs> I would do. I don't think that's a win. I'm going. <laughs> yeah. So Maine takes the top spot for the safest state. So this thing is kind of a hot mess of sources. So it comes from the U.S. News and World Report uh, by way of Nexstar, by way of the FBI, by way of the Hill to Ohm Town's aggregator. Um, named Gatherer. Uh, Russell Falcon is the author of this over at thehill.com. And um, that's a cool reporter name. Russell Falcon. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a character or something. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's see here. Maine is number one with 109 violent crimes per 100,000 residents. Is 100,000, I want to say per capita, but is, hold on. This kind of just spooked me, right? It's, yeah, it's. Per capita is for each person, so. Yeah. They'd have to put the data down to one resident. So the Which way wouldn't make a lot of sense because it'd be 0. 0.000 something. See, I always thought that it was per either 1,000, 10,000, whatever. But uh, according to what I've read, um, per capita is now 100,000. If it was anything other at any other time, I'm not sure. Um, I just and I thought I don't... it was per individual. So the, the definition basically means for each head. That's exactly what it means. But to keep from using a tiny little decimal, statisticians usually multiply the result by 100,000 and give the result as number of X per 100,000, according to oh, um, okay. robertniles.com. Um, but I thought that was a... a, a changing number um, as long as you disclose that like the per capita is this but maybe it's a hundred thousand now and it and maybe it's always been I, i'd have to look it's been a while uh, since i bothered paying attention to that kind of stuff i suppose i usually look at the stats and and don't really until i start looking back at what that what their base is you know what i'm i'm talking too much about this um, at any rate, Maine has 109. The next, <laughs> the closest one is 146. So New Hampshire, then New Jersey. I expected New Jersey to have much higher. In fact, I think New Jersey might be in the top 10 non-safest states. Like I would think it would be at the other end of the ranking. That's pretty wild. So now I'm really curious where does it where does it rank it says currently the 10 safest states are maine new hampshire new jersey vermont idaho rhode island massachusetts virginia connecticut and wyoming okay so there's something interesting going on in here most of these states not all of them are low population states right maine wyoming Right. Probably Rhode Island. I'm assuming Vermont and New Hampshire. Right. So they probably have a low overall number of crimes and a low population. 
Whereas right. a state like New Jersey, I'm assuming, is a higher population state. So overall, the number of crimes is going to be higher. But because they have so many people, their rate still falls pretty low. Right. It's diluted. I guess. Yeah. But I think that it. I think that Wyoming being number 10 and have 234 per 100,000 is kind of interesting yeah. because it's such a low pop. Exactly. They have um, about 500,000 residents. So that means they have what? About a thousand violent crimes. Yeah, it's interesting. Huh. Well, yeah, I guess if you want to live in the really safe place, you're going to have to move to a cold climb. Everybody just stays their ass inside. That's really You why. know what? You might be right because a lot of those are cold states. Look at that. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I mean, even Wyoming is cold. Connecticut is freezing. Virginia yeah. is the lowest, you know, on the horizon, yeah. I think. Right? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I guess you can't be committing crimes if you're all hunkered down because it's yeah. too cold to go out. <laughs> you try to get away and you freeze your ass off. All right. Let's go on. Let's keep going. The next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Archaeologists spot a quote unquote strange structure underwater and find a 7,000 year old road. Archaeologists uh, have discovered the sunken ruins of a 7,000 year old road that once linked an ancient uh, artificial landmass to the Croatian island of Korkula. I swear I have actually already seen stuff about this. Well, it might have um, been featured previously, and if it's considered scientific, sometimes we see those well, recirculate. Let's, let, let's see um, if the pictures that are over at Vice, um, yeah, because that's the source of this. So the submerged road, along with several other artifacts belonging to a lost maritime culture known as the Havar, I think it's pronounced that way, um, who occupied the area during the Neolithic era. Uh, Igor Borzich, uh, a researcher at the archaeology department at the University of Zadar, who was investigating sites on land, spotted strange structures at a depth of about 15 feet in the Bay of Gradina on the western shore of Kurkula. Um, according to a statement from the university. So let's go take a look. Maybe. Oh, that's interesting. Look at that. It has little paving stones like like a Roman road. Right, exactly. It reminded me of what they've been talking about on Curse of Oak Island. So uh, Becky Ferreira over at Vice.com put this article together. And it says here, let's see, this would be so much fun. I would love to be a diver doing this. Um, talk about specialized skill set. Um, and at 15 feet, you could stay there for hours, man. Well, anyway. It's crazy that it was that close to the surface and right, right. it took forever to, to locate it. Yeah, and at some point it was actually above water, right? Um, during the last ice age kind of a thing, if that's how far back it is, right? Um, so if 13, if it's been around since the last ice age, it was actually above water and when the um oh what is it called oh man thirteen thousand years ago there was a massive uh warming that um basically caused all the water sea level to rise um let's see if it if they talk about it in the article itself so in underwater in underwater archaeology research of the submerged Neolithic site of Soline on the island of Korkula, archaeologists found remains that surprised them. Namely, beneath the layers of sea mud, they discovered a road that connected the sunken prehistoric settlement to, of the Havar culture with the coast of the island of Korkula. Flint blades, stone axes, fragments of millstones were also recovered from the underwater ruins, so people actually traveled this road. Um, Let's see what else might be in here. Well, I also want to point out, because I didn't know where this was, but the um, article points out that this is in Croatia. So for those of 
our listeners who don't know where this town is. Right, now you know. <laughs> Let's see. Um, in addition to underwater surveys, archaeologists are also excavating ancient sites on land, including a cave in the nearby town of Vela Luca that has been occupied for at least 19,000 years by many different cultures, including the Havar. Pretty interesting stuff going on out there. I, I love the fact that we haven't just become passive about uh, the world history and we continue to peel back the layers to find out what actually has happened over time. Um, and I'm not really hip to the conventional archaeological uh, historical record um, because it's very convenient to just like place things and then say that they're there and then stick to it when on the face of additional context, additional research, you find out, oh, you know, this was actually occupied 25,000 years ago or 13,000 years ago or whatever. Um, and th there are some very sophisticated and and elaborate, comp technically sophisticated structures on every single continent, including the United States, which I had presumed I had always assumed because history uh, in the United States has never really leaned into that there were megalithic structures in the United States, but there were at the time when it was, well, I say discovered when it was discovered by, uh, the, uh, Europeans, um, there were estimated over a hundred thousand, uh, megalithic structures. Um, and now we're down to a thousand because, as we've moved across, we've basically treated the earth that we are treading on like locusts and destroyed everything in our path instead of becoming part of it, um, thus removing the historical record, not, not covering it up like what's going on in the UK. You know, as time has gone on, Roman roads and other historical records have just been covered over by dirt. But here in the United States, they were summarily destroyed. Um, much more aggressively. Yeah, I didn't realize that either. Yeah. So I, I can introduce you to some stuff. Um, at any rate, uh, interesting. And uh, I'm sure that we'll hear more about this as time goes on, because I, I thought I'd already read about something like this um, close to a month ago, if not longer. But let's move on. The next article is over in uh, the Tabletop Nights channel, and that's because it's RPG Maker Unite, which uses the Unity engine, um, has been released on the Unity Asset Store. It says after several delays and a last minute glitch, it's been released. It will soon come to uh, Steam as well. The original RPG Maker um, is sitting there now at half the price. But uh, developer Gotcha Gotcha Games has released the first edition of Amateur Game Development Kit RPG Maker Unite on the uh, um, official Unity Asset Store. The release comes after multiple delays, including from its original release date of April 6, 2023, when it got pushed back to address some further stability uh, concerns. So I have some ideas for some games, and I think that I will be acquiring this. Um, if you get it early, it's actually got a 10% discount, which eh, to many people probably isn't that big of a deal, but any percent is better than none. So in fact, RPG Maker Unite release uh, was stymied by uh, a, a supposed bug, I guess. Uh, it, it says here that the Unity Asset Store's product displays prevented the release from pushing through as planned, but it's been worked out. Um, it's sitting in my shopping cart right now. RPG Maker Unite is the first version of the famed RPG focused uh, software suite to be based on the popular Unity game engine. So the graphics are going to be kicked up a notch well beyond what the original was um, because it'll be able to take um, advantage of sophisticated GPUs um, like ray tracing and, and more complex um, features 
So like other entries in the series, it's designed to be a coding free experience using graphical user interfaces and free assets to allow users to craft their own bespoke role playing games. It also has its own default asset library that to get users up and running. I've actually played several games that are based off of um, the uh, RPG Maker uh, interface. So I think that it actually is a great asset to anybody that's interested in getting started in building games because you don't have to be deep in the reeds programmer. It's ninety nine dollars straight out of the gate. I mean, Go ahead. that sounds really great. And even for that price, because you could probably do infinite things with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, you get a mob character set so that uh, for free along with it. Uh, but you have about 13 days to to uh, pull the rip cord on that budget. So ninety nine bucks. It's actually eighty nine, eighty nine, ninety nine. Uh, after the 10 percent discount and if um there might be better deals if you're a student i haven't looked into that um but maybe there are and if there are uh, i'll i'll find out between now and tomorrow's show and um, i'll just kind of drop that in the preamble it's pretty cool i wish that there were more examples but there's no it's just this um, and this is amazing graphics compared to the previous version of it. Um, so anyway, I don't think I gave the author's name. I'm really sorry about that. This is over at rpgsite.net. And I didn't throw it into the chat either. So let me back up here. So, so I don't know is. if this is authentic, but apparently if you have a personal or student license, you should be able to use rpg maker unite free of charge free of charge yeah again bear with that yeah i'll have to look into it again it's been a while since i looked at this one because there's another um game maker from yo-yo games um that has the same type of language and i that's what's in my head right now so i i didn't look uh up the actual licensing for this um Josh Tolentino is the author of this article. Um, I know it's at the end of the article's discussion, but there you have it. Thanks, Josh. Okay, so let's go on to the next article. And this time I'm going to get it into the chat before I even do the transition. This next article uh, is in the Reality Hacker channel because it has to do with VR. And I'm going to say the title that I actually gave it in, in the rundown. EA F1 23 PC VR. Oh my God. Barbecue WTF. <sighs> That's a lot so, of abbreviations. It is. Uh, so Codemasters, the EA owned developer behind the F1 racing franchise announced F1 23 is coming to consoles and PC next month. Again, bringing its high powered um, or profile uh, racing game to VR. Uh, F1 23 is coming to PlayStation 4 or 5, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One. I don't know why don't they don't just say Xbox. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> um, the, uh, it, all of this is frustrating with this naming convention stuff because it's so silly. You know what? Why not just call it Xbox just One? Xbox. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I get why it's because it's generational and not every generation of the console, but blah, 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 or crying out loud. If anybody were to load it up and it not play, I'd be surprised in, in this set, you know, this is like 25 years worth of Xboxes for crying out loud. At oh, any rate, wow, I see what you mean. <laughs> Um, the and PC on June 16th, which is confirmed to include VR support on PC. So maybe I'll have to get my driving wheel again. Codemasters hasn't said whether it's going to be coming to PS VR 2 on PS5. So we'll just have to wait and see, according to the author. Um, as it is now, F122 only supports PC VR headsets and not PlayStation VR. Um, so Let's go over to roadtovr.com. And Scott Hayden is the author of this. 
if you're into F1, then you'll dig this. And its capability to tie you into VR makes it just that much more realistic. If you can get a uh, driving simulator along with it, then you can actually feel the road and every uh, beat, fart and whistle of driving it just like you would in the real world, except when you hit the wall, you won't be you know, ejected from your car or anything like that. There's a limit to the realism. Is um, this I'm the not first sure. VR racing? No. Or are there others? Oh, there's many, many I've others. I've seen racing games, but I didn't know there were any in VR. Yeah, there's quite a few um, VR capable racing games. Um, Pre-orders are now available for $70. It seems like games have kicked up a $10 hike in their uh, price over the last maybe three years, five years. Um, anyway, it'll be available via Steam, Epic Games, and EA Play. Uh, I don't know. Do I? Yeah, I'll just move on. Let's just move on. So the next article. One second. Is in the Daily News show. Italy is convening a crisis meeting this week to address soaring pasta prices. According to reports, Italy's industry minister has called it a crisis meeting to address the soaring price of pasta, Reuters reported. Pasta prices jumped 16.3% in April, while broader Italian inflation came in at 8.8%. This is kind of like uh, the Italian's egg crisis here in the States. Yes. Industry bodies have complained after prices uh, price rises cost families 25 euro extra this year. Italy's government is convening this crisis to address the soaring pasta prices. So what do you think could possibly be the issue? Oh, it's probably the wheat production in Ukraine. Hey, is it? yeah, I'm calling it now. If they don't mention it in this article, then uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but yeah, uh, the supply chain is still being impacted by uh, the conflict, the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. Yes, the special operations vacation exercise. Sure. Ryan Hogg over at Business Insider put this article together and I've been craving pasta um, all day today and been fighting the urge because, well, let's just say it's a lot of calories. And again, I went outside to touch some grass and instantly some children appeared and threw apples at me so that it would fall into orbit around my waistline. Yeah, I don't that, think any of that happened. <laughs> that dead air is the AI going, what? So let's see. Cold already, an Italian agriculture group said soaring price uh, pasta prices represented an anomaly that needs clarification given the price of a key ingredient, Durham wheat, fell 30% in the year for local publication, ANSA. According to ANSA, consumer group uh, Assatenti well, Asa filed a complaint with Italy Ministry of Enterprises after calculating price increases were costing Italian families an extra 25 euro this year. They say that it's an unfair pri uh, practice. The price of pasta may stay elevated per ANSA. They don't actually go into anything in this article. Um, they do throw a bunch of uh, links. It says the cornerstone of many of Italy's most famous dishes and a staple for Italian families has faced price uh, pressures for the last couple of years linked to increased energy costs and supply chain log jams, elevating wheat costs. But if wheat is dropping in price because well ukraine is uh, getting ever more stabilized and, for Sayed, Mahmoud, um, and they're getting their product out R really what's going on here uh, i can tell you it is because reflation that's right the producer price index which for the U.S. is called the producer price index, but the producer price index exists all around the world. Um, the producers, the ones who through mergers and acquisitions have acquired more and more power and influence and wealth are exerting it on the actual food supply. 
And if you have to go to some other country to get your food, you're going to run up against this consolidation. I think that it should not be allowed. There should be a minimum number of competitors in a space. Set the floor for the competitors, not the floor for the price or a ceiling. Basically, force competition into existence. If you have to go so far as to provide the means for a capable competitor to enter the market by way of grant funding, so be it spark interest. I can tell you from experience, that's exactly what happened in several industries in various states where uh, Ohm town has existed um, because it can travel the lines, right? The, it flows with the uh, electrons in the lines of the internet. And wherever this concerted effort to solve a problem exists, you have increased competition which means that you get better product, better service, better support, better everything. The time when suffering starts to occur is when there isn't enough competition. Then everything goes down the drain because there's mergers and acquisitions. Whatever does exist is basically the hegemony and people can't get enough resources to start up another business to compete, which is why I say have the government kick off capable production, capable uh, businesses, find some people out there that are willing to take on the risk using a grant and find the land if they have the land or if it's government land, then sell them the land and it's grant funded. They can spin up this competitive advantage on this land and they pay back the government and juice on top of it. Right? So it's not a complete, just here's a loan. And if you fail, so what it's here's a loan, do good. You can keep the land, but you have to give us some profits and the loan back. And it's at, you know, a fraction of 1%. Somebody's going to go, well, that's, you know, uh, unethical or, that's not really balanced or free market, but you know what isn't balanced or free market? Buying Monopoly. someone out so that you can jack the prices up and abuse the citizenry. The world doesn't exist so that a few people can consolidate all their wealth and power amongst a few people. It's sociopathic. It's antisocial. <laughs> so at any rate, you want to lower your wheat prices, spin up more wheat farms. That's how it gets done. Don't allow unfettered mergers and acquisitions just because somebody can throw a shit ton of money at someone and, and lower their bulk rate, right? The moment you throw so much money, there's actually laws in some states here in the United States where companies can't buy out another competitor because there isn't enough competitive range. They also can't lower their prices to the point where it's considered a loss leader because just because the juggernaut economic juggernaut can lower its prices below its costs and thus draw all the customers away from a competitive environment. They all come over to the cheapest location. And from that point, the competitor dies on the vine slowly and the juggernaut can just sit there and wait. In some states, that's actually illegal. Um, I think that that type of mentality should exist. It should be a standard mandate uh, in uh, economic, any economic framework. Well, it only helps everyone to have competition. It even right. helps the original business. Well, I mean, you don't get rich if you don't step on everybody's neck. But you don't innovate if you don't have any reason to improve anything. Well, uh, just to be devil's advocate, you don't need to innovate if you have a monopoly and you're killing off your competition. And because you're so big, everybody, 
everybody says, hey, when you're famous, you can just grab him by the wheat. Never mind. That's something. That's... That is not a thing. <laughs> well, with all that in mind, I think my uh, goose is cooked and my plate is empty and we'll bring you back to the front page and I'll just mash that little button there. And we get a whole bunch of new shows. Um, there was somebody that was complaining just the other day about SWAT being canceled. And apparently there is a reversal of the cancellation. Look at that. Well, that's interesting. It's also a weird time for a reversal to occur with the writer's strike. Hey, quite interesting, huh? I don't know. Maybe the the um, actors themselves will write their way out of this log jam. Let's see what else. East New York and True Lies both canceled at CBS after one season. Hmm. I don't necessarily want to watch a new show for the first season because it seems like so many new shows get canceled immediately. Yeah, you got to wait. Just wait and then watch, you know, 10 years of it. And binge watch uh, (laughs) multiple seasons. Yeah, really. Just take a vacation. So uh, I think, I don't know. There's, There's a whole bunch of articles. Um, go over to hometown.com and, and check it all out. Uh, I, I don't think that there is anything here. Uh, there is not a single area in hometown that I think is devoid of interest for everybody. Uh, you can go into all six of these categories and you will find something of interest in them. Um, and then we talk about it each day at 9 PM Eastern. So, uh, come and hang out. And as we approach, you know, we have a countdown, but it's kind of a an oddball countdown. We're, we're looking at about three and a half weeks. And then I will be um, hosting. Well, it's going to be a longer form hometown daily news show uh, where I will be either playing a game or um, talking about the news, either each category uh, each day and then at 9 p.m a an actual hometown daily news show that talks about all of the news that we uh, filter not throughout the day though uh, like um the hometown daily news show won't be focused on a particular category it will be everything much more holistic um but the games will either be vr base building um survival games um and chill games i'm really a, a chill gamer um so come on back hang out, uh, follow us here on Twitch, go over to YouTube, like, and subscribe there, download the podcast. Uh, It really does help us out, um, to know that people are interested in this material. Um, you're very important to, uh, hometown's survival. So I hope that you like the show and, um, we like you. (laughs) All right, that's it. I'm Mayor Watt. That's hometown.com. And up there is the AI from on high. You want to say bye? Good night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern. True. Bye-bye.